wonderful this morning. And I tell you, our God is an awesome God. Amen. Is everybody excited this morning? Woo, I am especially. It's been a long week, but you know what? God's He's directed every step. And I don't care how tough it gets, how hot it gets, how hard it gets, God will bring you through it. And he'll just, he'll just take you by the hand and go if you let him. And today, <coughs> I'm going to get right into the, to the message this morning. And I want to let you all know that uh, God loves you. He loves you with agape love more than anything you can ever realize. And what's happening, I see, in this old nation is this generation is turning pretty crooked. And you know, that's the work of Satan. That's the work of the enemy. You see it all around you. And it's bothering me, brothers and sisters. I want to say, what can I do? That's a key word today, do. And I look at the protest. Where are they protesting? Think about this. Huh? Anything they can get their minds locked on to. <coughs> and uh, tearing up somebody's property, wrecking somebody's livelihood, that's not protest. That's just evil. And... You know, and the Bible says in the, in the end times, do not be deceived. There's so many people deceived by what Satan's thrown out at us. It's something. We need to save ourselves from this crooked generation. That's where I'm at on this, on this message today. Been working on this a little bit. And, uh, you know, it's just re repentance. How many of you here think you need repentance this morning? Amen. Amen. We don't do something all the time correct, do we? We don't do something every day, every moment that's blessed by God. We need to repent from some of those things we have done. And that's a good thing because we can go to the Father and repent. And repentance and the need of repentance comes in many forms and fashions. I was telling Sandy a while ago this morning, and uh, there was a, a little problem. There's a couple needed some marriage counseling. And they went to the pastor. And I've been through this. And they, and they talk for a couple of meetings, and then the, the third meeting, I guess, they come up. He says, y'all, seem like we've been doing better. But I said, he says, preacher, I still got a problem. I said, okay, here's what we do. I want you to answer some questions for him. I'm going to start with you, sir. I said, I want you to look at your wife, and you tell me what her favorite flower is. And he looked at her, and those ever-loving eyes trying to be, he looked at her and leaned over and said, it's Pillsbury, isn't it? Uh, that's not exactly what we were looking for. And the counseling got a little nasty after that, so we'll stop right here. But who needed repentance, him or her? Hmm? Both, yeah, both. And then another little incident at Brookshire's, there's this little old gal come up to the 20 item or less aisle. And y'all been there, that's when I look to go to. And this gal come up there, kind of looked like Penny, you know, sweet, blonde-headed gal, walks up there, and she opened her purse up because that gal says, have you got a card? There's a little card where you, they flash it at the cash register, gives you a discount. And that, that young lady said, I think I do. But she opened her purse to get that card, and the cashier looked down, and she said, ma'am, do you carry a TV remote everywhere you go? And she said, oh, no, I don't. But see, my husband's refused to come with me today, and that's the only way I can get back at him. <laughs> Who needed repenting? <laughs> Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's just, you know, that's the little stuff. And we don't sweat the little stuff, but there's bigger stuff in, in mine. You know, it's uh, a third grade class. I'm, boy, I'm going to roll this morning. Third grade class. Any of y'all teachers out here? Have been, okay? Listen to this. <laughs> in the third grade, grade class, the teacher asked Johnny, he said, is the world round? And he looked at her and said, no, ma'am. And she said, it isn't? And she said, well, then I guess I suppose it's flat. He said, no, ma'am. She said, well, honey, if the world isn't round and the world ain't flat, then what is it? And Johnny smiled at her and said, my dad said it's crooked. Out of the mouths of babes. All this is going to lead to the message today because we see the need for repentance. We see the need of, of, of explaining to people, teaching them what God teaches us. Amen? Uh, there's one phrase. We're going to be in 
uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, where we're going to start. Is it up there? Yeah, through 41. That's where we're going to be venturing today. And Peter, he told the crowd at Pentecost, says, save yourself from this crooked generation. That's in the scripture. But there's a few problems in that statement. And we're going to go there today. You know what those problems are and what the Bible says about those objections? Well, there's one phrase in Peter's sermon. Let me get down on this. Let me get to 36 right here. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. I mean, it stuck them. Like, I mean, like a dagger. And, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? He's talking to the, to the to the congregation right now. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. That promise is to everybody. I'm telling you what, that's, that's inspiration to me. I love that. But let me go down here a little bit more. As the church grows, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted, exhorted them. He told them, be saved from this perverse generation. And we're in that same situation right now. We need to be saved from the perverse, crooked generation that's now walking this world. And he said, then uh, be saved from this. And then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about three thousand souls were added to them hallelujah they're listening and they continually steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles now all of those who believed were together and had all things in common and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone has needed need for anything and I'm going to 46, it's so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from the house to the house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity, simpleness in their heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And the Lord will add to our church daily to those who are being saved. He'll add to the church of the world those being saved. We have to go to God and ask. We have to repent. Boy, I'm going to tell you, they're going to hear that word a lot today. It's going to be like an old rope, you know, just zinging through the air. You're going to get burned if you ain't, if you ain't listening. Repent, repent, repent from your sins. And we're not above it, and we're not beyond it. There's a few problems in the statement with Peter, what I was telling you about. The first problem is that, that phrase, save yourselves. Listen, it's in the Greek, it's what's called the passive voice. Greek verbs have three voices listen to me now two of which are passive and active and when the greeks used an active voice as we hear in the scripture they're describing something i am doing for example i hit the ball i roped the cow i plowed the garden but when they use the passive voice they were describing an action that is done to me or to you or for me for example someone hit me or someone plowed my field for me. Something done for. Now, when you read save yourselves in Acts 2, verse 40, go back there and, and be saved from this generation, saving yourselves, we might think that salvation is something we can do by ourselves. Y'all agree? Uh-uh. We cannot do that by ourselves. An active voice, which implies that I can save myself, but it's not an active voice, it's passive. Remember the two script, what I was telling you, passive and active? One is, is what you do, and the other is what's done for you. Salvation is something that's done for me. Salvation is something that's done for you, to you. Peter isn't saying I can save myself. Because people look at some of these scriptures, brothers and sisters, and they get mixed up, or they don't really, if they misunderstand God's meaning of the scriptures. And the more we read them, the more we're into the Word of God, the more He revealed to us. But this right here, Peter isn't saying I can save myself. He's saying someone else had to do it for me. Okay, 
but who could possibly save me? Nobody got an answer? Jesus, that's right, Jesus Christ, amen. Y'all don't be afraid to shout something out. It's a good morning for it. I'm going to be quiet every once in a while and hear you. We can only be saved by the blood of Jesus, period, end of question. A better translation for this verse would be saved from this crooked generation, not save yourself from this crooked generation. This verse literally means that Jesus would save them, but they, here, here's the drawing line. They got to accept his offer. You have got to accept that offer, and you got to accept his offer with true love, true desire to be there. In this verse, Peter was saying, only God can save you. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't even earn your salvation. How many of you are thinking, I've been trying? Huh? No hands? Security cat. That, thank you, baby. You can't be good enough to be good enough to bribe God and get through heaven's gate. That's what I'm telling you. God has to save you. He has to save you. You cannot do it yourself. This concept this idea shows a lot up a lot in the Bible, in Ephesians. Y'all right, possum, you getting this? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that someone can boast about themselves or what they've done. And we read the same thing in the book of Titus. Chapter 3, verse 5. God saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. The Spirit renewed in us. Whoo! That makes me want to jump. I'm not Pentecostal, but I can get there. That makes me, oh, it makes me get it. It makes me feel like the Holy Spirit. Bam! You're mine, Tater. Oh, yes. You can't save yourself. That is the bottom line of this. And this is a Bible truth. And yet, in the spite of that truth, there's a lot of people who believe they can pay their way into heaven. In fact, it's kind of ingrained. It's put in our consciousness. We're trained to think that if you're listening to the wrong messenger. We have these little sayings in our culture. that, that You heard this? Well, you get what you have to pay for. You get what you pay for. Well, help me on this. I want you to complete this saying for me. There's no such thing as a free or a lunch. You're right. We've, we've heard that. There's no, there's no pain, no gain. Amen. God helps those who? That ain't the Bible. Oh, that's a misnomer. Yeah, but that's in the grain in us through, through our culture and through, through listening to other Man-made doctrine. It's just part of how we think. That you get what you pay for, so people try to approach God, and they, they won't offer to him to pay him to get into heaven. That's the wrong thinking, brothers and sisters. By their good deeds and self-righteousness, they hope to compensate God for his kindness and his love. The problem is, when they get to heaven, they'll be in for a rude surprise, because God doesn't want what you have to offer in that way. He wants all of you. And he gives you all of him. Martin Luther, he once wrote, noted, uh, Christ never died for our good works. They were not worth dying for. Listen, but he gave himself for our sins according to the scriptures. I have a little story here that I love this story. I read a story about a man who took his two little daughters out on a daddy-daughter date. And he told them, he said, you know what? I'm going to pay for all your fruit drinks, your ice cream, whatever we get. But the girls, they still brought the contents of their piggy bank, which was 80 cents. Oh, golly, they were stuck right there with daddy. As they were walking up to the counter, one of them said, I want to pay for mine. Well, he looked at her and said, hey, baby girl, daddy's going to get this. But it didn't matter. Nonetheless, she insisted, I'm paying for mine. Well, the clerk rung it up. And she said, that'll be $2.06. Well, a little bit, she put her change on the counter, and the counter down, she goes, um, that's not enough, the clerk said. 
In that moment, Daddy felt a little bitty tug at his sweater from the other daughter. He looked down, and she looked up and said, I think I'd like to use your money. <laughs> That's a sweet thing. Who does she go to? Her father. Yeah. Amen. That's the only way of getting into heaven now. We only get if we allow Jesus to pay for us. And he has. Yeah. He, he paid the note. It's in full. He got the receipt. And that was him. There's another problem with Peter's challenge in the, in the Scripture today. He said, be saved from this crooked generation. And you know what the big problem is? Sometimes we don't like to think we're in a crooked generation. Everything's rosy in our bubble. Amen? Feels like that to some. You know, well, I don't need to change. Or I don't need to face that. Someone else is going to take care of this. i got faith in that. God's got this. So you don't do nothing. You don't really get in the Word. Or if you're in the Word, you read it, but you contain it right there. Do something with it. Yeah. Do something. Tell your family. Tell your friends. You don't have to, like that cowboy. I'm, oh, I can't, I can't not do this. Old cowboy been out in the camp for six months. Hadn't been to town for nothing. Out of chewing tobacco, out of groceries, but most of all, he's out of the word. He goes to, he wants to go to church. And that morning, it had to be raining so hard it'd strangle a frog. He gets himself up to the church house and he walks in, and the congregation is light that morning. Matter of fact, there ain't nobody there but him. And he walks in, the preacher looks down, he's looked at his watch, and he's thinking, Boy, this storm's so bad, nobody shows up, but that cowboy did. He said, Son, I'm glad you're here. And he said, Preacher, he said, I'll come to hear the word of God. He said, I travel through this storm. I travel. It don't matter. I got to hear the word of God. And I want to I want to hear preaching. Well, the preacher, he swelled up like a toad. Got on that pedestal, on that podium. And he went to preaching, fire and brimstone, hell and high water. I mean, he went on for an hour and 12 minutes. When he finally got the last amen, and he looked down there, and that cowboy sitting on that back row in that pew like old Jeremy, and he's going... And the preacher went, hey, he said, cowboy, I give one of the strongest sermons I ever give in the world, <coughs> and I give it to you. Why are you back there sleeping? <laughs> he says, preacher, I know kind of what you feel like. He said, when I go out to feed them cattle, and I got that trip wagon that, on that trip, tripper on my truck, he said, I go to feed them cattle, they're hungry. But they come up to me, I don't feed them the whole damn load. Yeah. We can do that, you know. We can do that. We can get overbearing. We can tell people about Jesus to the point they're thinking, oh, I don't want to hear no more of this. God will give you the words. We need to be with God. We need to do something, but don't overdo. Do something and show people that the Lord lives in you. Do something and share him with somebody. Amen. Boy, I love that girl right there. She's raising her hands already. We ain't singing. We're preaching. I tell you what, God is good for us. Now, let's see, I got, I got off. Hmm. It's part of how we think, get what you pay for. So people try to approach God and offer to pay their way into heaven. God doesn't want that. And I'm going to tell you what, the only way we're getting into heaven, the only way he'll, is Jesus allows, if we allow Jesus to pay for it. Amen? Yeah. Are you going to let him? Yeah. yeah, let Jesus pay for it. He's give his self. He came out of a secure place, heaven. He come where there was no hurt, no shame, no pain, no nothing. And he come down here for who? For us. us. Years and years and years. I don't know how many years ago. I don't know the exact date. But he was. I know this. He was here when this world was created. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you look at John 1, 1. I'm gonna, that's a study lesson tonight. Y'all look at John 1, 1. Y'all tell me about it next Sunday. He paid the price in full. Now, there's another problem with Peter's challenge. He said, be safe from this crooked generation. We don't like to think we, that we're in it. Well, oh, yeah. There's a lot of crooked people around us. Amen? Yeah. And uh, don't be looking left and right. I'm talking about in general. Just a Wait a minute. And neither are my friends or the people I love or the political party I belong to. Everybody else is crooked, but not them. We're all nice people. Amen? Even Martin Luther had a dream. Y'all know that? Yeah. And the Bible says, au contraire, if you've got that kind of stinking thinking coming out of your head. Romans 3.10. 20 
12 declares, Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. And I'm thinking right now what I'm seeing on television, what I'm hearing on the radio. Protesters protesting anything but what's righteous. I mean, I didn't put that right. Righteousness ain't in it. They're protesting everything is evil, everything for, for the devil, and their minds are warped. And how are they going to come back? Somebody has to take hold. Somebody has to step forward in the lead and bring this country back. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Those who I seek my name, call my name. Pray to him. He'll hear our prayers. He'll restore our country. But we got to do it. Do it. That do it's a pretty important part of this message. Quit making butt tracks and make foot, foot tracks in the path of John of God. Okay, like John the Baptist. Hmm. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, takes us away. Our sins, like the wind, takes us away from God, takes us away from righteousness, if we allow this to be so. And God's saying, Repent. He's been saying that for a long time. Repent. He's always there. He's been there since Genesis 1, John 1, 1. He's been there. Now, we don't like to think like that, do we? After Paul told the Ephesian Christians what a wonderful people they were, he reminded them that before they become Christians, before you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, Following the course of this world. Have you slipped away? Have you slipped back? Remember what I told you a couple of weeks ago? I can't help this. Tula, she said, Papa, what do you call somebody who's quit our church and left? I said, backsliders, baby. And then she said, well, what do you call someone who's come from another church here? And I said, ah, baby, baby, you can't believe this. But these people are conformed, rebuilt, rekindled to come hear the Word of God. They're converts is what they are. Yeah. Amen. And if you're living in a life of sin, it's not too late. When you've given yourself to God to convert back. What, is, what does uh, forgiveness mean? All sins are gone away. If God forgives you for that. But that don't give you the right to keep on going back to it, going back to it, and expecting the same thing. We make a commitment to God, brothers and sisters. Uh, hmm. I don't know who wrote this, but it's dead on. You're not just lonely in need of a friend, weak in need of a helper, ignorant in need of a teacher, confused in need of a counselor, bored in need of a society. You're a sinner in need of a sacrifice. Amen. You're a sinner in need of a priest. You're sick in the need of a great physician, unclean in the need of a fount for cleansing, drowning in need of an ark. You're a sinner in need of a city of refuge. You're lost. You need a Savior. Yes. Amen. We all need that Savior. That's who we are. That's you. That's you. That's me. That's everyone else. We're lost in need of a Savior. And that brings us to the next problem in Peter's statement in the Scripture when he says, be saved. He says, even when you have to look at this as God having to save us, even when you realize you cannot earn your salvation, you're still left with Peter exhorting, his Peter exhorting audience to allow God to do that. You're still left with Peter telling us we have to do something. How many times you heard me say, do something today? How many times you heard me say, do it today? There's a bizarre theology that maintains you don't, that you don't, you, you can't do anything to be saved. You're so evil and corrupt and crooked that there's nothing inside of you that would allow you to even reach to God. That's a sinner. Therefore, God has to do everything because you can't do anything. Brothers and sisters, it's already been done for you. 
Amen. Our Jesus. There's a story about those folks who used to drive that home. They tell of a young man, asked a preacher, said, Sir, what can I do to be saved? And the preacher said, Son, you're too late. Now, I've seen eyes go up. You're too late. He says, uh, you're too, What? Said the boy, I'm too late to be saved. And the preacher said, No, son, you're too late to do anything because Jesus already did it all 2,000 years ago. He did it for us. It's already done. I, and uh, I got to tell you something else, too. Okay, you know, all the time preachers will, will ask uh, for the sinner's prayer. And some preachers introduce it because, uh, well, they know you, need to, you know you need to confess. We know that you need to talk to God. We know that you need to ask for a Savior. And uh, it goes like this. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come in my heart and my life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Have y'all prayed that prayer? Even if you're here right today for the first time, if you prayed that prayer, is that enough? Is that enough? Think about that. Good answer. Hmm. We do need forgiveness. We are sinners, brothers and sisters, as we sit here today. We do want Jesus to live inside of us. We do want him to be our Lord and Savior. It's a great prayer. It's an awesome prayer, but there's one small problem. It ain't found anywhere in Scripture. That's a prayer that we go to God ourselves. You go to God yourself. And it's uh, Acts 2.37. It says, The crowd is so shaken by Peter's sermon, they interrupt him and said, Brothers, what shall we do? Here we go again. You got 37 up there? Read that. What do we do? On the bottom. And Peter says, You don't have to do nothing. It's all done by Jesus. Did he say that? No. No, ma'am. Well, I know, I know this. Peter said, y'all just come on down front and repeat this little prayer with me and, and, uh, and everything's cool. Is that what Peter said? No, that's not what he said. What did Peter say? Peter said, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Woo! That is awesome right there, brothers and sisters. Mm -mm -mm. Well, the crowd had already believed that Jesus was sent by God while they were there, and then he, that he died for their sins, and they had been a party to his crucifixion. They'd been a part of that. That's why they asked what they should do, but they hadn't truly repented yet. Now we're getting down to the gist of the message today, the gist of it. You might have confessed your sin, but have you truly repented? Have you truly, truly repented in your heart? And they hadn't been baptized into Christ. Have you been baptized into Christ? There may be some, most of us here have. There may be some that haven't. But I'm going to tell you, it's, it's important. It's important. New repentance. Now, now repentance, listen to me. Isn't that hard to figure out? God's been telling people to repent since the Garden of Eden. Amen? That's been a while back. Repentance was the message that John the Baptist constantly repeated in his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is almost here. Yeah. It's close. God has our days numbered, brothers and sisters. Let this penetrate into your mind and your heart and your soul. Repentance is simply, listen to me, repentance is simply accepting that you have sinned, then making a commitment. Hear me? A commitment not to make any excuses for our bad behavior. Making a, making a commitment not to make excuses for our bad thoughts and our bad works. We commit not to try to explain away the things that we have done. Instead, we admit to God that we sin and we commit to God that we won't do it again. That's where the sinner's prayer comes in its, in its strongest. When you make that commitment to God. That's, why, that's what repentance is all about. And most reasonable people will accept that. And where they get stuck, where people get stuck on this, is through baptism. And I understand that why they have a problem. I mean, just we just got done saying that we can't earn our salvation. Amen? 
and we can't do it by works. You can't do anything that will buy your way into heaven. And here Peter is asking his audience to do something physical to be baptized. Well, everything, everything else in the salvation plan before is mental that we've talked about. And we decide to repent. We, we, we decide we believe. And we decide to confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's mental. But baptism is physical. Amen? Now, stay with me. And because it's a physical act, there's a lot of folks that see baptism as being a work. It's not really necessary. I can think all day about planting a garden or cutting my hay field, although I really don't want to, and that's not work. But once I go out and begin plowing and planting and weeding, that's work. That's why I don't do a lot of that gardening. Uh, my wife does. And so these folks who object to baptism see everything else as thinking. That's belief, repentance, confession. That's thinking, but baptism thing is working because it's physical. Enough already. Listen to me. Here's the question. Is baptism a work because it's physical? No, it's not a work. Amen. First of all, God never calls it a work. Nowhere in the Scripture is baptism ever called a work. That's man's definition of what baptism is. In fact, if you ask someone who objects to baptism's involvement in salvation for a Bible verse that describes what baptism meant, they'll often quote a verse that doesn't include baptism. If they quote a verse at all, more often they'll give you their definition of what, that, what it's about. And they'll say it's an outward sign of an inward grace. Okay? But rarely will they give you the true definition of baptism in the Bible. But I don't want their definitions. I don't want their opinions. I want the Bible's description of what baptism in the Bible has nothing about it about baptism being a work. Now, second, by definition, baptism cannot be a work. A work is something you do. Baptism is something that's done to you. You follow me on the difference right here and the importance of it? If, if I go out the garden and plow and plant and weed, that's work. But if you go out in my garden and you do that work and I don't, in the same way, baptism is where someone else does the work. Now, there's a baptizee and there's a baptism, a baptizer, Okay. A baptizee, that's you. A baptizer is who will assist. The baptizee doesn't do a thing. They don't work because the action is done to them, not by them. In baptism, you allow someone to bury you in water. And the convert does nothing except permit someone else to bury them in water. Buried like Jesus to rise again, a new life. That's done to you. That's done for you. That's not work. Mm. I'm going to close with this. What, what repentance and baptism are all about is humbling ourselves before God. Making that commitment. Confessing our sins. Asking for forgiveness. And committing truly to Jesus Christ. And I bet a bunch of you out there are going, well, I've committed most of the time. Uh-uh. He wants your commitment forever. All the time. It's hum re repentance a humbling experience because people don't like to do it. Amen? Boy, I get the head shaking now. If I repent, I have to admit that I'm not good enough for God is who I am. Mm -hmm. I have to admit that I have to change. But I don't like that because it makes me feel weak. It makes me feel a little unworthy. It's very humbling, isn't it? And baptism can be humbling as well. When a person's being baptized, they're literally putting themselves in the hands of another person, trusting that person not only to put them underwater, but to bring them back up. And that vulnerable situation is humbling in itself. You'd be surprised how many baptisms that, that we, we, we have, we officiate over, and people are scared to death to go under the water. Scared to death to be covered by water. I'll let you up when the bubble quits. This is a saving experience. Additionally, someone once described baptism this way. Baptism is the great equalizer. It don't matter who you are, how successful you are, or who you know. All of us have to go under the water alike in the baptism. There are those who come, they come up here, they, not here, but they come places in expensive suits, dangling gold jewelry off of them all over, $100 hairdos. Glad I married a barber. 
But the suits are exchanged for a humble white robe, brothers and sisters. The jewelry comes off, and they may as well say goodbye to that $100 due. Because baptism and baptism, all the trappings of this world are left behind. It's a very humbling experience to get rid, to lose, to not be a slave to worldly desires and things. Now, it's nice to have things. It is. But when you're going about it the right way, and that thing is not an idol, that thing is not taking the place of Jesus Christ, that thing is not what's on your mind all the time. God should be on your mind all the time. In baptism, we die to sin. That's it, die to sin. We're buried in the waters. We rise up from those waters, a new creature, amen? amen? Not because of any good deed that we've done, not because of any righteousness we can claim for ourselves, but because we're depending upon the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, which he did. Yes. For who? The church. For us, his bride. Amen? Yes. Now, we don't want to follow the ways of this old world. We need to save ourselves from this world. We save ourselves by going to our Lord Jesus. We ask forgiveness, repentance. Anybody sin this morning? Oh, come on. Anybody sin this morning? Now, now I'm getting some ways back. We all sin. But you know what? Our God forgives us because we don't use that. We don't use that salvation and assurance as a, as a free ticket to go and sin a little bit. Well, God knows who I am. He knows me. He knows I'm going to change again. One of these days, there might not be a time to change again. So that is the importance, brothers and sisters, of when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only have you accepted him as salvation, you have made a commitment to him. And how easy this old stinking, cruel world can divert your attention and get you to come back over on the, on the brushy side of the pasture. It's amazing. But Jesus Christ will take you by the hand and put you right back on track. He loves you. Let's keep him as our shining light. Because when I die, when I leave this earth, I want to be in heaven eternally with my brothers, my family, my friends, my sisters that have gone before me. There's only one way to do it. That's through Jesus. And when you ride for the brand of Jesus Christ, you never ride alone. How about that? Hmm. Riding for the brand, Psalm 91.1, John 3.16. Boy, I like these sayings right here. Don't get off the track, brothers and sisters. It's so easy. But look to one another. Lean on one another and lift one another. And share in the love of Jesus Christ, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this message. And I pray that these words go out across the nation. And folks, see a revival in your church. Father, I pray that, that our Christian brothers and sisters make a stand, stand up and show that we're not going to be in this crooked generation. We're not going to be a part of this. Father, thank you so much for giving us that, that power to save ourselves from that crooked generation through you, through you, Jesus. Be with us as we go home this afternoon and this whole week until we come back again. Let that be filled with, with preaching. With us walking in righteousness and people saying, I want what they got. I want to know what's, what's happened to them people. What they got that I don't have, and Father, that is you. Let us be bold, unashamed, ready to over and under for you to reach out and touch. And I ask these things, Father, in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, y'all. Go through this week thinking about this. Ride for the brand and go hard, okay? Don't let this crooked generation, this crooked world suck you in. Stand up for the Lord. I'll see y'all next Sunday. Love you.